Good morning. My name is Dan Wright. On behalf of our pastor, Reverend Teresa Soto, our justice team, with us today are Amy Carlson, Mickey Duxbury, Janet McFarland, Heather McLeod, and Helen Duffy and Bill Chorno. Worship associate and producer, excuse me, Vincent Rains, Renee Witten, and others on the worship team. Welcome to worship at First Unitarian Church of Oakland. Please note, we are recording this service. If you don't want to be in the recording, please keep your camera turned off. And you might think of changing your name if you don't want your name seen. You will find this and other services on our website. For the best viewing experience, we recommend that you install the Zoom app on your device and update to the latest version. And now Debbie Kaplan will welcome you from the board. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name's, as Dan said, Debbie Kaplan, and I'm a member of the board of trustees and speaking for the entire board, we're really happy you're here this morning. We are an intentionally multi-generational, multi-racial, multicultural, inclusive, and anti-oppressive religious community. Um, and this Sunday is just all about that. You are welcome here today. We invite you to fill out the guest connection card. If you're new, it's in the chat. And we wanna be able to support your exploration of what's available in our community that interests you and how you might participate, whether you're new or not. It's a continuous exploration. There are so many different ways to be involved and get while you give. So welcome. Now, before we begin our worship service, we have a few reminders. Um, our board uh, will be meeting on Tuesday, October 26th from 6.45 to 9 p.m. and that will be on Zoom. We're still doing everything by Zoom. And there is a session on the love of poetry October 19th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. And the theme is Surprised by Beauty. There's also an October book group, and that meets on Thursday, October 28th from 6.30 to 9.30 p.m. And that's what's going on with us. I will now turn things over to Amy. And now let us join with Unitarian Universalists throughout the country and the world in lighting our chalice words this morning from Reverend Dr. Cynthia Landrum. Flame of our faith, call us into community of love and justice this morning and every morning. And now let us light our Black Lives Matter candle. We light this candle in recognition of the Black Lives Matter movement. We commit to dismantling with daily action the systemic racism that tries to deny the full humanity of Black people. And last month, Oakland passed a sorrowful milestone the 100th homicide in the city. May the light of our peace candle illuminate that in the interdependent web of all existence. Each and every one of us undeniably is connected to every victim and to every perpetrator of violence. And may the words of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. bring us to peace. Nonviolence means avoiding not only external physical violence, but also internal violence of spirit. You not only refuse to shoot a man, but you refuse to hate him. 
In a real sense, all life is interrelated. All men are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. I needed a moment to let those words rest. But now comes one of my favorite parts of every week when we unmute our microphones, leave our seats and greet one another. Leave our seats. Good morning. Hi there. Hi everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Hi everyone. Hi Heather. Good morning. Hi Erin. Hi Kathy. Hi Amy. Hello. Good morning, Judith. Hi Judith. How are you doing? Hi Dan. Hi. Hi there. Hi Dan. Hi, Hi, Evelyn. How are you doing? Hi, Hi, Sally. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Hi, Janet. Hi, Dan. Hi, Steve. How have you been? Good morning, Beth. Hi, Carlos. Hi, Mickey. Hi, Dan, Heather. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Emily. Hi, Hi there. Hi, Clark. Hi, Jen. Hi, Emily. Hi, Gregory. Hi, Greg. How are you? Hi. Hi, Carol. Good morning. Good morning, Carol. Hi, Judith. Hi, Esther. Hi there. Hi. Hi, Aaron. That was enough. <laughs> oh, well, okay. I would like to say, Hi, Dan. I would like to say thanks to everyone who was brave enough to turn on your camera today. <laughs> it's good for me to be with you all, for us to be together. And now we are fortunate to be given a story read by Heather McLeod. Good morning, my name is Heather McLeod and I'm a member of the Environmental Justice Advocates team. Um, so in the Sufi tradition, stories are told about the Mullah Nasruddin, a holy fool. You may have heard the story about the time he lost his key and was looking for it under the street lamp. A person noticed that Nazruddin was looking for something and stopped to help him find it. After about an hour, the person asked Nazruddin, can you remember the last time you saw your key? Nazruddin pointed a block away into the darkness and said, well, I heard it fall over there. Then why are you looking for it here? Asked the person. Because... The light is here. <laughs> Nasruddin has a certain logic. How can we see anything if we go to the dark spot where we heard the key drop? I like to know things. It feels comfortable and reassuring to do what I know how to do. I feel foolish and frustrated and maybe even a little frightened when I don't know. But we're in a stage with our justice work where we are exploring outside the circle of light that we know. We're not just looking under the old familiar street lamps of helping or fighting injustice or making a difference. Not that there's anything wrong with those things, but what else is possible? If we think about the joy and creativity in building a just new world instead of protesting injustice. If we think in terms of building accountable mutual relationships instead of helping, our accompaniment team accompanies new immigrants. How is that different from helping? 
How do you accompany someone who has significantly less resources than you do? And do we have to wait for the government to provide restitution? Or can institutions provide reparations and restitutions for wrongs done? Members of our congregation have participated in the camps protesting the Line 3 oil pipeline. As settlers, they have followed the lead of the Native people organizing these protests. Is solidarity different than being an ally? When we think of the eighth principle, for some of us, it's easy to support in the ways we're good at, like wordsmithing a sentence to make it stronger because we care. But can we wholeheartedly and whole-mindedly support the people of color who have put this current wording forward and yet hold back our good ideas about how to improve the words? How do we hold the awareness of how our eagerness to help might be insulting, yet remain eager to participate? How do we make sure there is a welcome table for everyone without taking charge and assuming that we're the ones providing the food, planning the menu, and deciding who to invite. And finally, can we celebrate that there is much for us to learn? How do we say joyfully, I have no idea, and then step forward into that unknown space and feel our way around together? Come, let us worship together. Join us in singing, we're going to sit at the welcome table. Macy, daughter of Charlotte Dixon and Jack Macy, was raised in this congregation. She's now attending McAllister College in Minnesota, where she became involved in the protests against Line 3, a pipeline that transports oil from underground the boreal forests in Canada through Minnesota. She was so moved by her participation that she took the semester off school to spend full time at the protests. Our congregation has participated with her 
by sending $1,000 in solidarity with Camp McGeezy, the group with whom she's working. Um, this is, um, so we're going to show a, a video because she's so busy working at the camp, it's hard to get her online. I'll put in the chat some actions you can take to join her. And here's Lydia. Hi, my name is Lydia. I use she, her pronouns, and I am talking to you from Berkeley, California, um, unceded Ohlone land. I am so happy that you joined us today um, and that you are interested in learning more about Line 3, maybe learning about Line 3 for the very first time. Um, thanks for coming. That's awesome. So I went up north to line three a couple weeks ago um, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about that experience. There's a lot I could say. I won't be able to get it all into this video right now. Um, but I, so I first heard about line three a couple years ago. Um, I go to school at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota, which is Dakota land and is just three to four hours south of the Line 3 corridor, the Line 3 replacement pipeline that's being built. And at McAllister, I study environmental studies and I'm focusing on environmental justice and indigenous rights and sovereignty and political movements. Um, and so I have discovered my passion for that at McAllister and also uh, have a ton of peers that are really involved in the movement to stop Line 3 and have been spending time on the front lines throughout this year. And I've been really eager to get up there, given how passionate I am about it, how terrible this pipeline is, how important it is that we stop it. Um, and I was long overdue to get up there, but I finally went um, up to the pipeline for the first time at the Treaty People Gathering, which was just a couple of weeks ago, and then I ended up returning the next weekend because I needed to be back there. Um, and when I returned, I went to this encampment that was on an Enbridge, drill, uh, an Enbridge easement at the drill site of the first Mississippi River crossing, the first spot where the Enbridge pipeline, uh, where line three will go under the Mississippi River. And the easement is like a boardwalk that, hauls, that allows equipment to be hauled out across the marsh. Um, and so folks were camping there for eight days. And I was lucky enough to join the last like three days, I believe. Um, and so, yeah, we were set up along the boardwalk and it was truly one of the most moving and meaningful experiences of my life. And I can't even convey to you fully why that is because words are not good enough. Um, but I want to share a little bit about what was so meaningful about that to me. Um, first of all, being uh, led by Anishinaabe indigenous leaders, specifically women and two-spirit leaders, was really profound. Um, and, you know, being invited into their space, being invited into their ceremonies and their prayers, um, and just these really intimate spaces where they were teaching us about their indigenous wisdom and their teachings and the ways of life that their ancestors have carried for hundreds of years and how they live in right relationship with the land um, and they they just welcomed in allies with open arms and wanted to teach us how to live in a meaningful way um, and how to be with the land and that was i can't explain how amazing that was something that i want to mention that really moved me was one night um, this indigenous man was telling us a story about how he when he first learned english his worldview shifted um, because in the Ojibwe language, there isn't a, we don't, con the, in the Ojibwe language, you can't conceive of humans as being higher than the natural world. Um, whereas in English, the natural world is talked about as inanimate objects and as things and as nouns, and they're not talked about as living beings and relatives. Uh, that are our teachers and that are on equal footing with us. And he talked about how when he first learned that, or when he first learned English, his worldview shifted because that's not how we conceptualize things in English. And when I heard that story, I felt my worldview shift a little bit. And I feel like I could actually see what he was talking about. And I could actually see myself kind of like shrink down into level with the earth 
um, which is really incredible. And I don't know if I'm describing that well, but um, yeah, so learning those teachings was really remarkable. And now I invite you into a time of prayer. Spirit of life, spirit of love, one who holds us, most holy one. We come before you this morning, thankful for our lives and all that are gathered here today. We especially hold those who may be hurting in our community and in the wider world who are hurting in mind or in body. We pray for healing, we pray for comfort, and we pray for strength. We pray for those in our community and in the world who are struggling just to survive, who are weary, who are in need of home, in need of shelter, in need of work. May they, may they know rest, security, and abundance. May they thrive. May all thrive. And we thank you for all the ways in which our community supports one another, fulfills our mission, strives to fulfill our mission. And <clears throat> We are grateful for all the ways in which we reach for wholeness, liberation, and justice, even in this time of pandemic. And thank you for the words of Lydia this morning that remind us that we are part of the whole, that we are part of our earth, and that there is no hierarchy, so that we are interwoven with all that is. And may we continue to just be called in to responsibility for that whole, called in to the earth and to each other. Help us not only to be a people of rights and what is ours, but a people of responsibilities. Thank you for those of us in our community who are doing the work and reminding us to reach for that wholeness and for that liberation. And may we continue to do so. In all that is holy, in all that is love, We hold these in our community. Amen. And blessed be. And now I would like to introduce Corliss Smith and Claudia Morgan, who will be uh, performing Leave a Candle in the Window by John Fogarty.
sometimes, when I'm working away, trying to make a difference, I get tired. I can't write another letter. I can't send another email. I can't make another call. And I can't send any more money. It just doesn't seem to help at all. I remember the Women's March and the Waterkeeper demonstrations, the Martin Luther King Day March, Urban Shield protests, the energy of all of us together, and that's what keeps me going. That's what's my candle in the window. As long as I can see the light. Put a candle in the window Cause I feel I got to move Oh, I'm going, going I'll be coming home soon Thank you, Heather and Claudia. And thank you, um, Corliss and Amy it, and Lydia. It's all been very powerful and moving. My name is Mickey Duxbury, and I've been blessed to serve this congregation for the last 20 years in some configuration of a justice council or a justice team. And I title my reflection today, we are in uncharted waters, but we are in them together. Many of us have found ourselves in various emotional states during these pandemic times. We've often been filled with confusion, fear, anxiety, even some panic at times. Some of us have been hunkering down since the beginning of the pandemic. I know I have watched entirely too much television and cable news and Netflix. Many times I've sat on the couch and have had existential angst about what am I doing with my life? Because all I was doing was watching too much television, only at night, I might add. It was hard sometimes to be creative in the midst of all of this. Even if most of us were listening predominantly to NPR, we have still been being bombarded with the world coming apart at the seams. The repercussions of 500 years of white supremacist colonialism and imperialism seem to be coming home to roost in every corner of the globe. We don't know precisely when church will open. And when we do open, we don't know for sure who will return. We don't know who might have found other ways to worship or decided that after 18 months, well, we don't need a church at all. We don't know if enough people will return to renting our beautiful historic building. We don't know if we're gonna be wearing masks for the next six months, another year, or for the rest of our lives. We don't know if after the Delta variant, there'll be another one and another one and one after that. We don't know if the unvaccinated will finally become vaccinated and protect us all. We don't know if the 2020 election, which protects some of us, and but how long that will last. We do know that millions of people around the country for years have been working hard and they're at it every day to restrict voting rights to exclude people of color. We think we know how bad it could get because we all watched January 6 over and over and over again. But we don't know how much worse it could get. But 
there are things we do know. We know, although it's hard to always hold it, that there are more people around the world working for equitable sharing of resources, working to pull back from the abyss of the climate crisis. Zoom meetings can't quite convey the um, strength of allies around the globe. People on the margins are in every country of the world have been fighting for their lives, for their land and for water. We know that many in our own congregation have been working in small and bigger ways, engaged in the sole work of justice during these weird, confusing times. One of the many things that Heather did was to organize her students and her nephew's Boy Scout troop to write postcards to Black and Latino voters to get the vote out. Helen Duffy and Bill Charneau have been working with Alliance of Californians for Community Empowerment, known as ACE. They've been promoting legislation to develop social housing through the use of state funds and local initiatives. There's a slide for that. They've been knocking on doors in an organizing drive to help low-income tenants who are confronting their own landlords. Bill has been helping defend a self-governing homeless encampment called Wood Street Commons. He's been meeting with residents and city council staff and helping design actions to stop their eviction from public lands that, that this community has occupied for two years. Claudine, on the other hand, Claudine Tong has phone banked and phone banked and phone banked and played bells and transported drums for Boom Shake, music for the revolution. Now that looks like so much fun. I feel like I wanna know, can an older white woman join Boom Shake? <laughs> anyway, um, Mary Lane and many others in our congregation showed up in Chinatown and Lake Merritt to protest Asian hate and the murder of George Floyd. And many more of us demonstrated against Sheriff Ahern and our criminal injustice system. And we've demonstrated for voting rights and against voting suppression. Even if we don't know how this is going to end or when it will end, we need to come out of the darkness and move into the light. It's time to move out of the unknowns of this pandemic and our political situation. What choice do we really have? Our souls, I think, are calling us to be awake. They're calling us, well, they're calling me <laughs> to turn off the television <laughs> and do something else with my life force. Many of us have not been totally hunkering down for the last year and a half. I know we can't see us all, but we can see some of us. Raise your hand if you've phone banked or texted. Raise your hand if you've given money to progressive candidates and maybe too many progressive candidates. Raise your hand if you worked on affordable housing or homelessness or, re or criminal justice. Raise your hand if you worked on our new accompaniment team. Raise your hand if you reached out to family members that you don't talk to very often. Raise your hand if you reached out to old friends that you haven't connected to in years. Raise your hand if you begged, pleaded, and prayed to the universe and everything that you might call God that our experiment in democracy would come out of this period alive. It's been overwhelming. And at times it's gonna to continue to be overwhelming. But the answer is not to put our blinders back on. We are called upon to be even more discerning in this time of crisis. What can we do that each makes a small difference? What can we do, each of us, that brings us back into our church community. We've all been in uncharted waters and we have been in them together 
even though a lot of times we haven't known that or felt that we are not alone. We need to bring the lights of our souls together so we can see a wider path forward together. I trust that we can. I want to end with a quote from Rainier Maria Rilke, an Australian poet and philosopher from the 19th century. Australian? No. Have patience with everything unresolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves as though they were locked rooms or books written in a foreign language. Don't search for the answers which could not be given to you now because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything, live the questions now, perhaps then someday far into the future, you will gradually, without even noticing, live your way into the answer. Amen. May it be so. Hi, my name is Janet McFarland. I'm a member of the justice team as well as a member of the JTW team. And I'm the liaison between the two of them because we need to talk to each other and work together and support each other's efforts. Before we start the invitation to generosity, I would like to invite you to a World Cafe Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Um, Noemi is going to post the Zoom link in the chat and we are having intimate conversations about the eighth principle. The eighth principle has been how I have been working with our congregation um, for a good better part of the last year with JTW to prepare us for the congregational vote at the special congregational meeting, which will happen during the service on December 12th. So I know you want to be informed and I know you want to be with us. So, and I know you want to be heard. So please join us Tuesday night for our World Cafe. Um, thank you. Now I will back up and start the invitation to generosity. This is the time we consider our checkbooks. We need, to, we consider our needs and we ask, what value does this living, justice-seeking spiritual community have to me? And if you're like me, you can't put a price on it. However, try to consider what is a meaningful contribution. I try to consider that. What would be a meaningful contribution for me and my means, and that is what I give to the church. The giving information will be posted on the slide and we'll have 90 seconds to, um, to uh, go to the uh, website and um, you can uh, follow the links to, to giving to this church.
Thank you. Uh, this morning, you have heard from the justice team about giving a, a grant to the Line 3 camp in solidarity with ind indigenous peoples fighting for sovereignty over their land and their water. You may be aware that the accompaniment team, another justice project, obtained a grant from the church for the Guatemalan woman who is being reunited with her family and establishing a life here in Oakland. These grants were made possible because friends of the church over the years gave donations explicitly for justice purposes. Now members and friends can donate to the church's Aurelia Reinhardt Social Justice Endowment directly. By policy of the board, when this fund reaches $250,000, we can take an annual draw of 2%, that's $5,000 annually, for justice within and beyond our walls. Right now, the fund has $231,000. That represents amazing generosity, dedication, and legacy gifts from the estates of members. The goal of $250,000 is in sight. Only 19,000 remains, and then we will have a dependable source of justice giving in perpetuity. If you would like to give to this fund, send a check to First Unitarian Church of Oakland with the words Social Justice Endowment written on the memo line, or use the link in the chat. Scroll down the giving page to find where to donate to endowment funds. And now, please unmute yourself and join me in saying the words of the Congregational Commitment. To the work of the we church, the church, which is weaving a vast love of all communities, we dedicate ourselves and be our, our offerings. Thank you. Now, please mute yourself, and I hope you will sing along with the chancel choir singing over my head.
Wow. Oh, we are so blessed to be in this community. I know I am so blessed to be in this community. Uh, the inspiration and um, yeah, just enthusiasm of this community keep me going. I would like for us to do a communal blessing. Um, let's just for our uh, benediction, if you would just rub your hands together. If you want to show your video, you can. If not, that's okay too. Let's rub our hands together. <sighs> Feel the warmth. And put your hands in front of the screen. Blessing our community, blessing our time together. And as we extinguish this chalice, may we listen to what we are called to do. May we be called in to community, to one another, and to the liberation of our world. And may each of us know peace, may we know love, and may we be a light to each other. Amen and blessed be.